The good news is, I know exactly when Kevin Durant's coming back. But the bad news is, I can't tell you guys. Running back is up next. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back. Yeah. Run Welcome it to Running Back. Run it I'm your host back. today, yeah. Eddie Gonzalez. I'm filling in for Michelle Beadle. Michelle, please come back. Please come do your job. It's really hard. I'm joined, of course, <laughs> by Stadium Insider, Sham Sharania. My guy, Chandler Parsons, and bold for wearing the Buckeyes tee today, Evan Turner. It's usually better times for you in March, but I yeah. guess it's a little uh, different this year. This is for the women's team. This is for the women's team. They're in the Sweet 16, so I, I, I'm rooting for them right now. There you go. Look, we're going to talk some March Madness later, so let's, let's, let's come back to that. <laughs> but last night, we had a full slate in the NBA. The biggest game of the night, the best game of the night, Clippers, Thunder. Don't look now. We got a powerhouse in Oklahoma City. 500, the seven seed, and Lou Dort clamping up Kawhi at, to finish the game. Didn't even get a shot up. What's going on, Kawhi? What's going on with that? So, uh, SGA, he had 31.7 rebounds, four assists. Kawhi only finished with 21. Chandler, how impressive is that, what Lou Dort did at the end of the game? You locking up Kawhi, who is back, who's looking incredible for the game, a game they absolutely need, too. Yeah, this is such a big moment for them for their season. The fact that they're even in this situation is unbelievable. I, I counted these dudes out. I was all over the Clippers last night. Young team, big game in LA, celebrities in the club crowd. And these dudes don't care. They play hard, they play the right way. And this is textbook defense. Lou Dork was physical, he didn't reach, he moves his feet. Everyone else is shrinking the floor. So Kawhi Leonard really didn't have many options other than to kind of be able to rise up and shoot over Dort, which he couldn't even do till the clock struck zero there. So this was unbelievable defense. And, and the Oklahoma City are so impressive. If Mike Brown wasn't doing what he was doing with the Kings, I think they got the coach of the year here. They have the highest ceiling with the team. They have an absolute stud in SGA. All these talks about trading SGA, who could we get for him? They shouldn't do that because this guy's a star. This kid can grow with this core that they have. They have all the talent in the world. They have all the youth in the world. And they're going to be so dangerous in the next next year to the next five to ten years if they keep this core together because they are super impressive. Yeah. Chandler, I definitely agree with you. Um, you know, with the core, you have uh, Josh Giddy, he's averaging like 17, 7, and 6, shooting 48% from the field. Jalen Williams, arguably the rookie of the year. And then when you look over at SGA and, uh, you know, their main core is super tough. I think not only in the next year they're going to do well, I think they're going to make a lot of noise come playoff time. Not saying they'll necessarily win a series, but it's going to mold well for the future. And I think the experience is going to uh, continue to take them to the top. Exciting times at Oklahoma City. Uh, they've been rolling out Chet Holmgren for the KD workouts before the games. He looks healthy. We're not going to see him this year, unfortunately. But you got to be looking forward to that next year. The real story of the game last night, though, PG... Had a great game going at 360 dunk in the half court. He looked amazing. Suffers a terrible knee injury. Like, this is tough to watch. When you see a hyperextension to that point, you know something's going on there. Shams, what's the latest on PG? What have you heard? What's going on out there? So they had tests last night on Paul George's knee. They had, uh, they're going to probably have more tests today. And he left the arena on crutches in a cart. There's real concern within the Clippers that this is a serious injury. And like you said, Eddie, he literally had a 360 dunk in the half court a few plays before that. Uh, and he's been playing at such a high level this year. They're only all-star th th this campaign, um, tr just a tremendous year. So, of course, this hurts. If he really is out for the remainder of the season or the playoffs, if he misses significant time, this hurts the Clippers' chances to make the, the playoffs, make the play-in. Uh, this affects their chances as far as if they can win a championship. Uh, so a lot rides on, on, uh, on you know, essentially whatever the MRI result is for Paul George and, um, you know, just a devastating injury. Yeah, I yeah hate only one this. game. Uh, only one I, game ahead of the Lakers, the Grizzly, the, the Pelicans in the loss column. They could just as easily fall out. Chandler, is this is this going to end their season? Like, what, what are we looking at here? 
Well, I hate to see this injury, especially to Paul George. We all know everything that he's went through with his previous leg injury where that thing basically snapped in half for Team USA. And he's been back, and it was a long journey for him. And he's back. He's their all-star. He's arguably their best player other than Kawhi right now. The 360 dunk in a half-court offense, you rarely see that, right? So this is tough. And, and the Clippers have had their ups and downs fully healthy. You take Paul George out of the lineup, I do think they are no longer a contender with him out of the lineup. And the more I just watch this video right here, that's a gross-looking landing. And I, I don't like what I saw there. Kind of hyperextended it. I'm sure he's getting multiple tests and first and second and third opinions on it. But this isn't good. So I'm thinking about him here. And I, I hope it's not serious because he's been playing at a, at a high, high level. And he is a huge part of the Clippers' success this year. And without him... I, I don't really see it. Yeah, yeah, me neither. I think uh, they, need, they need every piece, especially a Paul George, to be full throttle to be able to be a you know contender, even have a chance at it. You look at the West guys are getting healthy and hitting a stride, and you even look last night, even if they went up against a team like OKC, a young team, could you really say that team would be able to beat them without a Paul George? And um, the fact that they haven't really been having an opportunity to mold and blend too well was already tough enough and weighing on them. So. Hopefully Paul's okay. They can, you know, hopefully it's a Paul Pierce type miracle, but uh, that, that looked tough. A lot going on in crypto arena last night. Look, the convergence of that was the big trade when they got Kawhi. You have Shave throwing up 31. And, and even this situation right here, Kawhi gets a tech, the rarely seen tech. He was clearly fouled. And then Terrace Mann gets ejected for protesting the tech as well. <laughs> Uh, Chandler, what do you think of three texts in five seconds against two guys? And we're talking about Kawhi here, too. He very rarely does this right here. What happened right there, Chandler? I mean, well, wa watching that replay, he definitely got fouled. He got bodied on the way up. The dude reached. And, and Evan, I don't know about you. I don't I don't recognize half of these new refs. Maybe we've just been out the game for a while, but I don't know yeah. who this one is. <laughs> right? I, I, I have no clue either. <laughs> I've never seen this cat in my life. But listen, Kawhi Leonard, you know something went majorly wrong if he's barking like that. And clearly Terrence Mann said something personal or something very, very foul because usually you don't get the, the heave-ho that quick. And three texts in four and a half seconds is wild. And, you know, at least Kawhi didn't get kicked out, but Terrence Mann's been playing great for them. And this obviously yeah. was a blow to, their, to the game last night because they end up smoking the game at the end of it there where they could have used Terrence Mann. But these, these refs... Uh, hopefully he said something to deserve it because this you, you can't just toss a guy from, from that from an outsider looking in with no audio it didn't look that bad yeah that's what i'm saying three texts in five seconds maybe one maybe two after the third you're kind of feeling yourself you know what i'm saying it's time to uh <laughs> it's time to come on home you know like, it, it, it doesn't make any sense and obviously i wish i bet the clippers wish they had it back because they lost by one and you know it's, it's just one of those tough uh it's a tough five seconds to say the least you get a purse. You get a yeah. purse. <laughs> yeah, it's it was crazy. <laughs> you get a tag. You get a tag. Yeah, yeah, that was wild. That was that was wild. You always hate when the guys get the text when the ref was actually wrong. Wait, you're wrong, and I said you're wrong, and now I'm in trouble. What do, what, what are we doing here? What's this? To eject the guy on that too? Like, come on now. In but from SoCal up. In, yeah, a lot of game left, too. Like, he, he had to have said a couple magic words, but I, I don't know about that one. Yeah. But, yeah, look, a lot happening in L.A. From SoCal to NorCal, the Kings, the Celtics. Celtics with a big win last night. Uh, Jason Tatum, 36 points, 8 rebounds. Jalen Brown, 27 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists. Chandler, how big is the confidence boost of this? How big of a confidence boost is this for the Celtics? This is a long road trip they just finished up. They needed a big win going home. How big is this for them? Yeah, it's always good to end it uh, on, on a win like this, especially a team that everyone's all chattering about. Everyone's talking about how such a good year they've had. And this is considered to be one of the better teams in the Western Conference. And this, this definitely gives a boost of everything. All the struggles the Celtics have been going through. Everyone's talking about how good Milwaukee's playing and, you know, Philly's on the rise. and. This, up until a couple weeks ago, has been the most consistent team in the league. They've been healthy for the most part. They have arguably the best duo with Jalen and Jason. So this is a huge win because maybe the Kings are a team that they eventually have to go through. But I think this just shows you the power of the East. When you look Milwaukee, Boston, Philly, 
in my eyes, they're a lot better than Denver, Memphis, Sacramento. So there's definitely, I think, whoever gets out of the East is going to have a good shot at this. But this is definitely later in the season, a big confidence boost to go in and, and, and knock off a team that's considered to be the one of the other teams in the, in the other conference. Yeah, for sure. I definitely agree with uh, Chandler. I think um, Boston has shown they've been the best team and the most deepest team the whole season. I think they've been great offensively and defensively. And I think, like, their two best players is greater than, you know, some of the other, you know, duos and tandems, two best players. You got two young players that can play on the wings, both sides of the ball. And at the same time, one of those players is a full superstar and the other one turns into baby MJ when he doesn't play well. And uh, you do that with the length and, um, you know, so much versatility in the roster. I think Boston is just a team to be reckoned with and they'll be playing until June. Yo, the, the huge story yesterday from Logan Murdoch at the Ringer. Shout out to my guy, Logan. Uh, Jalen Brown, a little revealing. That has, had felt a little bit of a way about KD possibly being traded for Jalen over the summer and apparently reached out to Jason Tatum and Brad Stevens together. Shams, you're tapped in. You're the guy you know. What's the dynamic between these two guys? I, it doesn't seem like they're the best of friends, but w w what is this here? Also, I love that you guys are airing this because that quote, makes this clip look crazier in retrospect because Logan mentioned, he talked to him in January. This game's in February. Who knows? But Shams, what's the energy like between these two guys? Well, I, I think there's like this mutual level of respect. I mean, ET can definitely speak to it at a, at a higher level as well. He was there, he worked on the staff. But I think when you think about those two guys, there was definitely questions, concerns. Uh, conversation was strong a couple years ago. Can Jalen Brown uh, and Jason Tatum coexist can they play together at a high level and that's when the Celtics at one point even reached out to the Sixers when the whole Ben Simmons situation was going on they had conversations they showed interest in Ben Simmons but the question was are we going to trade Jalen Brown for Ben Simmons no we're not and they wanted to see those two guys through and I think those two guys had serious conversations looked at each other and they they want to both win I think that is the biggest thing is both guys want to compete want to win at a high level yes it's about you know, sometimes personal accolades as well, but they want to win at a high level. And I think that more than anything wins out when it comes to those two guys. Yeah, I'm curious ET's take. I'm curious his opinion. No, I think it's always so overblown because I've been I've been around those guys a lot. So, you know, when it comes down to it, they have the utmost respect for each other, like big fans of each other. I think one thing that goes without saying, I think some of these talks and everything of Jalen Gannon's respect motivates them to the umpteenth degree. I think he talks about it, takes notice of it. But I think it motivates him because he still comes out, he still competes, he still plays at a high level. And if you look at some of the clippings, he's a big Jason Tatum fan. And there's another thing that occurs that we keep forgetting as well. There was a video that surfaced from when Tatum was like 10 years old, 11 years old, and he said that he mo modeled his game after Kevin Durant. So, I mean, I think we might just be digging too deep into, you know, any type of, you know, buddy ball or back door and much more than, you know, two guys working out and a kid living out a childhood dream, probably. I'm so happy you said that because, look, yeah. Jason works out with a ton of guys. His trainer, yeah. Drew Hamlin, is in is high demand, and you end up in the gyms with a lot of guys. He works out with Joe Embiid. Yeah. He works out with everybody. That's the summer. That's L.A. in the summer for NBA guys. So I get where, where Jalen's coming from, but for Jason, like, he's just getting his reps up. But going back, a lot of this stems from your report, Shams, that the Celtics did offer Jalen Brown for Kevin Durant. What was the package? What were the conversations? What happened last summer when all this came about? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we saw uh, Jalen Brown's comments in that story saying that I guess, I guess Brad Stevens told him he wasn't going to be traded. And, and listen, at the end of the day, that was true. I mean, the Nets at that point did not want to trade Kevin Durant. In their mind, they wanted to keep him. They wanted to exhaust every option. Even after Kevin Durant went and had a meeting with the owner and told the owner, you either got to fire the GM and the coach or trade me. Like, they went through a lot last summer, and they ended up running it back. So, yeah, trade was never in the cards. But... Like I reported last summer, an offer was made. Jalen Brown, Derek White, a first-round pick, from what I'm told. Now, could they have negotiated beyond that and passed that? Potentially, for sure. Um, but that was the, the, the offer made. And so uh, Jalen Brown stays. And when you're talking about a player like Kevin Durant, you're not going to get him without giving up a, a, a guy like Jalen Brown. So I don't think you look at that as a slight if you're Jalen Brown. Like, you are a package. Yeah. You know, if there's ever going to be a star trade, you're going to be a part of it. But you yeah. are the star now. Like, he's a guy that's vying for all the NBA. 
Yeah, he should be happy that like he's not getting in a package with like five other people. Like that's the most embarrassing <laughs> trait. Like you know what I'm saying? At least it's star for star. They call it a blockbuster. Not like you show up on a different team and they're like, wait, you're here? That type of thing, you know? Chandler, tell me a little bit about this dynamic. Is this something that's typical? You call your teammate, you get them on the phone with your coach, with your GM, with your president of basketball ops? Or is this crazy abnormal? Because I have no clue what to make of this. I mean, I what I see it is a guy who's a little emotional, but also confronting everybody. But is this typical of that workplace? I mean, once you realize that the NBA is a business and the team is going to do what's best for the team, that can give you peace, right? Because just in free agency, as Evan Turner or Chandler Parsons, you're going to sign with the team that financially gives you the most money. That's your best fit basketball wise. And that makes the most sense for you. And on the flip side of the team, they're going to do that as well. So there were definitely situations with me where, like when I was in Houston, there was trade rumors that I was going to get traded actually to Boston for Rondo. And I, I was hurt because I thought we had something special there. And I thought I was, but that also I was flattered in a way that Boston thought so highly of me that they were like, I was basically the centerpiece of Houston to go to this trade along with, you know, whoever else it was or picks or whatever. But it, once you realize that it's nothing personal, which it always kind of your feelings will get a little bit involved. You will get salty a little bit because you create a family a, a, a relationship here and you spend all your time there and your kids start going to school there. And, and it's it's a weird thing getting traded. And it's definitely even weirder knowing that you were in the trade rumors and then going back to that team once you don't get traded. But it's nothing personal, and you could look at it two ways. You could be offended or you can be flattered. In this case, Jalen Brown, he knows his game. He knows his worth. He's an absolute star. I would look at it like, wow, I almost got traded for arguably one of the best players of all time because I'm that good. So it could go either way. It didn't happen. He's in a great situation. He's on a great team this year with a chance to win a championship. Let it go, and he's not going to be in the trade rumors. Let's force someone like Kevin Durant. Evan, you've been in the organization as a player before both of those guys were drafted, then as a coach in the locker room with both of those guys. What you know of that dynamic, is this abnormal? Is this kind of like part of the course? And knowing Brad, knowing Jason, knowing Jalen, do you think this was positive for them all? I think what Chandler said in general, I mean, if you had to ask the Brad Stevens, it's like he's not trading a Jalen Brown for anybody. And when it comes to one of the best players in the game, you really have to take that into consideration. Um, I think one thing that occurs in that organization is Brad is an open guy. He always has a door open policy and he says, come talk to me if we have any problems. And I think they all handle it like an adults. They didn't run to the media. They didn't run to anything. The first, apparently the first call that Jalen made was to Jason and Brad to talk to his counterparts like bosses. He's one of, you know, franchise players and he's going to go talk to his president about what's going on. Because at the end of the day, if he's not okay and his mojo is not fine, that energy in the locker room could go 10 times different. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and by the yeah. way, most, most teams, when you do have that dialogue, they're open with you. Like, when I was in Houston, yeah. I was a young player, but I was cool with Mikhail. I was cool with Daryl Morey. Yeah. I was cool with Tad Brown. So they were letting me know, and they were kind of talking me through, like, yeah, there is a situation here where you could be moved, but, like, you're not going to find out on Twitter, and you kind of have that open dialogue throughout the whole thing to where they're letting you know first. But... It all depends on your relationship with the front office, with the staff. But usually, yeah. if they have decency, which most of them do, they're talking to you man to man, and you're gonna hear it first. But like Mikhail Bridges saying he found out on Twitter uh, that he like that is where you. That's when you get pissed off. And that's when you leave with some some you know bad feelings. Well, look, the, the, with the win, the Celtics climbed back into the two seed yesterday. It's Sixers lose, they fall back into the three seed. Evan, you've played for both teams. We asked this question yesterday, so I got to ask you, which of these teams is better right now? Who would you take in the series if they lock up? Because they very well could in the second round of the playoffs. Man, I'm taking Celtics every single day and twice on Sundays. I think uh, for the reason, <laughs> with, the, with this history, I think Boston Celtics just has their number. I think they just have their number. Besides the fact that I like, you know, the Celtics top eight better than, you know, the Sixers top eight. But... The way MB's been playing this year, you have to take into consideration of something occurring. But, you know, Jason Tatum, he's been through this a lot. That team is, uh, the team's been playing hell of defense. And, you know, at the same time, Marcus Smart, if he has to shut down MB, maybe he could do it. He's done it before. 
But we finally got you to disagree with Chandler. Chandler definitely picked the Sixers yesterday. I picked Celtics oh, really? as well. I just like the yeah. matchup better. I just like yeah. the amount of wings they have in Boston. And I think they have just enough bigs to bother Joel. But, I mean, we'll see. And, Hopefully and- we see. I need this series like I need oxygen. Yeah, but the Philadelphia, like, sports space, they're literally, like, poison when it comes down to, like, any close series or anything like that. So I feel like... Every season ends in, like, negativity based around, you know, the mojo. That's an interesting layer. Nobody would know mm-hmm. better than you, so that's an interesting oh, yeah, layer. On the, other side of the, on the other side of the dockets, the Kings, they lose a tough game. They seem to be pretty firmly planted in the three seed now with Ja Morant coming back. Tough, tough schedule for the Kings. Fifth game in seven nights. They played it all four time zones. Kings are the three seed. The Warriors right there are the sixth seed. Chandler. Who would win that series if they lock up? I'm taking the Warriors. And I, I hate to, you know, kind of poop on the Kings. They've had a great year. They, they, they're doing everything right. It's great for the city. It's great for the league. The longest drought. Good news is it's going to be broken, right? They're going to the playoffs. And it's going to be an interesting series. And when you look at the Western Conference standings, most teams are circling the Sacramento Kings as who they want to play in the first round just because of their inexperience, because of their team. Uh, and, and they've never been there before, really, to any of these guys. So I, I love the Warriors' experience here. I love their shooting. I love their depth. I, I just think they're a better team that have kind of been enabled with injuries and guys in and out of the lineup all year long. I don't think it'll be a blowout. I don't think it'll be a sweep or anything like that. I think it'll be competitive. Uh, and I think it'll be a really good series, but I just, I got to give the the edge to the champs here. They've been there multiple times and, and Steph Curry's the best player on that floor every single night. Uh, and and I, I can't see the Kings beating them four times. I really can't. Yeah, I agree with Chandler. I mean, the Warriors are in the playoffs. I mean, you got the golden child, Steph Curry. I mean, you don't quarrel with him. I think he's going to figure out a way to win. And, you know, elevated to the next round. Uh, the Warriors are just always great at that. They have so much experience. And, you know, they can they can take it to the next level when they need to. And uh, a four-game series is something they can focus on. They've done it millions of times. I love the Kings. I love the, the season. I love the beam. I love Mike Brown. But, yeah, give me the Warriors in five. Like, I, hmm. <laughs> Wiggins or not, give me the Warriors in five. I just trust the experience. I trust those guys. Over there. I'm sorry. You know, you got all summer to get better, Kings, and I think you will. But from California, we're going all the way out here with me to Brooklyn. The Cavs and the Nets locked up yesterday. Cavs with a big win, a bigger win than the score says. It tied up a little bit late. Donovan Mitchell, 31 points. He hit five threes. Jared Allen, 12 points, 14 rebounds on his former team. Evan. How far can Donovan Mitchell lead the Cavs in the postseason? They have the best defense already in the league right now. How deep can this team go? Uh, I'll give them a second round luck. You know what I'm saying? I think uh, I think the Cavs are really talented. I think, like you said, their defense is very good. They have great, you know, backcourt play. I just think they're going to run into, you know, some tough uh, matchups in the second round. And um, I'm not too sure how, you know, if, if the game falls on Donovan Mitchell's back, I just think, their other star might have more experience and, you know, uh, you know, more depth to be able to, uh, you know, beat the Cavs and send them home early. Yeah, listen, I, I think they're gonna the series is the is they're gonna get the Knicks in the first round. I do think they'll they'll survive that. But then we're talking about a whole nother monster where they gotta go play Milwaukee yeah. in the second round. And I don't think they have enough, and that's nothing to take away from them or their season. I think they are young enough where they're, they're going to continue to build. I think yeah. J.B. Bickerstaff is one of my favorite people, let alone coaches, on the planet, and he's done such a good job with them. And every time I talk to him, he's talking about how this group is so unselfish. They genuinely like each other. It's got that AAU team vibe where they just like to go out there. They hoop. They're young. They play video games. You never hear anything about anything bad about, like, Mobley or Jared Allen. These kids, are they're, they're just – they're dorks that hoop and that they love it and they you know what i mean like that that helps that's half the battle these kids care they just love playing basketball they don't they don't dress up for the tunnel walking in the arena they are just hoopers and they like each other and they have two absolute stud guards and darius garland and donovan mitchell it's just they're going to kind of run into that second round series assuming they get past the knicks where they're playing against another monster of milwaukee or cleo or boston or philly so it's, it's been a great year for them. And I think the experience they'll get getting to that second round will do them, you know, wonders for next season. The camaraderie is a great point because when they got Donovan Mitchell over the summer, I wondered 
what the dynamic of the team would be. They were such a different energy last year. And then you got this obvious, this dynamic athlete and, and offensive personality. And he had a banger last night. We're going to have, we got to have yeah. a special addition to that man has a family because Donovan Mitchell, he might be the best in-game dunker in the league. And he caught my guy, Yuta Watanabe, mm. on the break. And my goodness, like, this is... Your guy or Chandler's like, come guy? On. This is, this is, <laughs> you, know, I, you know I love Yuta Watanabe. Shout out to Japan for beating USA last night. But this was, this was filthy. This was a yeah. body to body. You have no shot of blocking this. Yikes. Yeah, I know I mean, Yuta says he doesn't care about like posters, but it's like, a, like <laughs> there's some eventually where it's like, it's a limit. Like this is nasty. Oh. We see him fall like the last time, but that was Donovan Mitchell, right? Come this on. isn't as bad as the Anthony Edwards one when he was in Toronto, the, the baseline one, but this was, this was up there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yo, I've, I've never Shout jumped high enough to get I've never jumped high enough to get dunked on like this, but the fact that he has two of these on his on his resume, that's a little tough. You got you got you got a feel for the guy on that one. But yo, Donovan also broke out the sham god last night. Evan, you had a nice handle. I seen you drop LeBron before. You ever broke out the, the sham god in the game? Nah, not since cool. I was Pull like 12 three. years old. But that was that was crazy. <laughs> that whole movement. I mean, he really put on a show last night. I, I saw that. I'm like, damn, he turned up. Oh but my god. Uh, two a pull yeah, of three. I don't know if we've seen that to like that type of three, that deep of a three. Like that was like three feet behind the three-point line. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, you could do anything you want after that dunk. <laughs> All with the right, <laughs> too. That's disgusting. <laughs> you're, up, you're, up 20, you're up 20 points. You're in New York City. You know he's got something in the crowd watching him. He, this was, <laughs> this was a, these were two nasty moves. Yeah, that's, uh, that's tough. I just hope... For the sake of him, I just hope they stayed overnight in the city. I hope they didn't leave too early to go back to Cleveland. I hope he was able to stop by, say less, and you know what I mean, bask in his glory. Right. I, I heard Mitch. I heard Mitch enjoyed the city. I heard he was. I heard rumors. <laughs> rumors going around. You know, hey, it's it's springtime in New York. It's it's feeling great out here. But on That's the other end of the, of the docket, Michael Bridges had a tough game. You know, this is just what they are at this point. Dayron Sharp led them in scoring 20 points, 11 rebounds in 19 minutes. Evan, how dangerous are they for as a first round matchup? They're at the sixth seed right now and could fall <laughs> even further. I mean, I think they're dangerous if you, you know, don't take them serious. I think this is a team that's still trying to, you know, figure out their way. They've had success, but it's been up and down some nights. You've seen them win big games, and you've seen them take a couple 20-point losses. So I think it's one of those things where you don't let uh, this group get confidence too soon, especially a young star like uh, Mikael Bridges, who is, you know, really turning the corner and finding his own. But right now, I think they'll, they'll get a lot of experience in the first round and continue to... Uh, continue to learn how to play together and, you know, build towards the future. But, you know, I, I think it's just a participation thing. It's been a long season for the Nets. They got a bright future either way. They seem to be a locker for the playoffs. We'll see how it goes. But up next, the tempers flare in the Hawks-Pistons game? Yep, in the Hawks-Pistons game. We'll talk more after the break. Run it back. Run it over. Run it back. Yeah, yeah. Back, guys, we got, hey, we got, I guess, tempers flaring. We got some weird stuff going on. Pistons, Hawks, Jaden Ivey with the shot late in the game. Apparently, the Hawks didn't like this. They were up 20. I don't know why they care. And tempers flare is what they say in quotes here. What do you guys think of the rookie doing this, Chandler? What happened on this court? This is very confusing to me. Uh, well, this just shows that this game was god-awful. This is the highlight that we're showing here. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, it's usually the, the 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 pissed off feelings usually happen of the team that's up that goes and scores. Yeah. You know, this is kind of irrelevant. The shot clock's already out, so it didn't even count. They're up 20 points. The kid's a rookie. He's trying to just get his game off. I don't see the big deal here. If I was down 20 and a guy and like a kid on the winning team did this, then that's where I would get pissed off, and then there would be an issue. But to me, this is nothing. This is too teams that the game is already over the team's down 20 who cares like the I, I don't see an issue with this unless the roles were reversed it's not a big deal to me 
Yeah, I don't think it's a big deal either. If it was the other way around, sure, and they're up 20, we're like, right, sure. But this is just, uh, you know, just smoke that wasn't needed. I, I mean, just go home. Everybody else in the building went home. Let's just call it a night. The Pistons say they were upset about the lack of defensive effort from the Hawks late in the game. You're down 20. It's, I, I'm upset about your lack of offensive effort. I'm so <laughs> confused about this entire thing look the Hawks have made a coaching change a couple weeks back they're five and six under Quinn Snyder they're the eight seed as of right now Evan what's changed in Atlanta since Quinn Snyder took over are they better are they worse what's going on out there I mean I think the voice has changed because uh, when you break it down um, you know their old coach Nate McMillan he was under you know Lloyd Pierce's staff so I think you know the identity is something new for him even though you get a new coaching staff uh, you know, or he switched up the coach. It doesn't mean the energy is, is different. So I think Quinn Snyder coming in with his group has been huge. I think, uh, you know, what could change the offense? You know, Quinn Snyder has always been known for being an offensive guru. And uh, you remember his days in Utah, he has some of the best, uh, you know, offense in the league for several several seasons. So I think they'll be able to kick it up into that, into that gear eventually. But um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, offensively, obviously with what he did with Donovan Mitchell in Utah, he could kind of do something similar with DeJounte Murray and with Trey Young in Atlanta. But it's it's usually just a breath of fresh air with everything the Hawks went through with, with the Lloyd Pierce era and then the Nate McMillan. It's just to get in a fresh face sometimes just changes your attitude and your positivity. And look, they're, they're a 500 team before Quinn Snyder, and they're basically a little bit under 500 with him. So I can't sit here and say they're drastically better. I think Quinn Snyder is the right guy for the future of this team team and look they're the eighth seed they're gonna have to they're gonna have a tough first round matchup uh maybe they can make it interesting we know they survived and advanced a couple rounds a couple years ago but uh this is gonna probably be a, a short season for the hawks but I, th I think it's more about the potential and they kind of under uh, under uh, exceeded expectations for this season right i thought atlanta was gonna make that jump they added Dejounte murray i love deandre hunter he's a year older Clint Capella is a Salt Lake. And they had the pieces, I thought, this year to kind of make that leap and to be a, a factor, and they just didn't. So they're going to kind of regroup this summer. They got their coach moving forward, and we'll see what else they do. But they're kind of just sitting there in this 500 area, and they're going to draw the Bucks probably first round, and it's not going to be pretty. I feel like at this point we know what the Hawks are. They're the eighth seed in a 15-seed conference. They've been at or one game above or below 500 for the last 26 games. It's really ridiculous. They've been the definition of mid. I don't know if you should be impressed or depressed or what, but they are mid. They're exactly that. Who knows? Who knows what Quinn Snyder does in the future and what he can change with that team, but really strange season for the Hawks. Yeah, On the other the side of this... Speech? <laughs> that's the <laughs> one. I think that's it. Like, yeah, yo, you guys are perfect. <laughs> yeah, are we wasting our time or are we not wasting our time? Like, give me a little flow. Get Sorry. to watch some... <laughs> Some nice Trey Young shots all year yeah. long, I guess. Shams, on the other side, the Pistons have lost 15 of the last 16 games. They are tanking to perfection right now. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel with the potential high pick coming their way? Or what like what is the what's the energy out there in Detroit right now? I think the energy is let's see what happens on draft lottery night and let's see what pick we get. Hopefully we get the number one pick and we get Victor Wembanyama. And if we don't get the number one pick, you could get the Thompson Twins, Brandon Miller. There's a few other guys I think on the board. I don't know if you go Scoot Henderson if you're there. I'm curious what Chandler and Evan think. But obviously, Cade Cunningham being out this year set them back a lot. Uh, his development and now he's going to be shelved for the rest of the season obviously and hopefully he'll be back for the start of next year um, but I, I think once you get him back you see what what draft pick you get and I think this summer is is going to be an important one in Detroit because I think starting next year you're going to see a team they kept Boyan Bogdanovich that was a big sign that this team is actually going to try to be competitive next season uh, to a high level so we'll see exactly what they do in the summer. Yeah, that's a good point there, Shams. Is I, Bogdanovich, you, a lot of teams wanted him this trade deadline, right? And, and he's been very, very good for them. So that shows me that they want to add pieces this summer, keep Bogdanovich, and kind of have put themselves in a situation to try and make a playoff push next year. And you look at their roster, they have young talent. Cade Cunningham's a budding star. Jalen Ivey's had a great year. I think they got an absolute deal with James Wiseman. I still think the Warriors gave up on him a little bit too early. And now you're going to have a chance to hopefully be in that top three. And if they get the, if they get Victor, great. Now they actually have a promising, you know, franchise changing piece. 
I also love Brandon Miller from Alabama. I think he's the best player in college basketball. You watch him. He's kind of a mix of Paul George meets KD. He's long. He's athletic. He plays defense so there are different players in this draft that can help them right away i don't think even if they get the first pick and they get victor i don't think they're still a playoff team next year i think it's going to take time but the only light at this tunnel is that you know they were so bad obviously they get a great pick and this is a top heavy draft where you can get a franchise changing piece if you're in that top three or four picks and i and i agree with chandler as well you know when it comes down to it this is, a t this is a, you know, draft heavy draft. So even if they get, you know, one through three picks, I'm a big Scoot Henderson fan. I'm a big fan of Brandon Miller. It's a couple guys coming out where even if you don't get the big fella, you still, I feel as so even just looking at Scoot Henderson's body and everything like that, you, you can get a generational talent to at least, you know, get some trade value on and, you know, build your team the right type of way. And they have a lot of young guys. You just Hope they don't do what the Lakers did, you know, with Brandon Ingram and D'Angelo Russell and all that, where they're, you know, just um, asset building. But, you know, I, I think the future could be bright if the, if the chips fall the right way. I do wonder the fit of Scoot next to Jaden Ivey and Kate Cunningham as he comes back. But I'm with you. I love Scoot. I love Brandon Miller. You really can't miss in this top three, so... That was their plan coming in, and that's what they got going forward. But from two listless teams in the East, we go to two listless teams in the West. The Pelicans blew out the Spurs in a game that nobody is going to remember in a week. But Brandon Ingram, he had 32 points. Jonas Valanciunas had 19 and 15. Chandler, they say that Zion's comeback is looming. We may see him. W what is your confidence level of the Pelicans getting into the play-in if they get the big fella back? I mean, they, they need him. Obviously, we know how explosive, we know how dynamic he is when he's on the floor. And again, we talked about this yesterday. This team was so impressive early on this year where we were talking about Willie Green being the coach of the year, like 20 games into the season because they have been they were peaking. <laughs> bunch of young talent they have these young guys that defend they have brandon ingram that gets buckets cj does a little bit of everything and zion who when he's on the floor he's one of the most dominant players in the nba so uh, there's no reason for him to keep sitting if he's healthy and he can play and it's not going to kind of ruin his offseason and linger in the next season let's get him out there let's shake it up because we are a dangerous team when we're fully loaded and they think they can play with anybody so it doesn't matter their seed they're just they should try and get into this plan it's right there get the big fellow back in the lineup and, and see what happens he has all his five six months to rest and to heal and to lose weight or to do whatever else they want him to do this summer if he can play right now it's huge for them because they were a very very good team i looked at them kind of like a grizzlies early on they're athletic they're young they talk trash they, they they have a star in zion they have a star in john moran they're very similar teams they just haven't been healthy and when they are they're very very good so get them back as soon as you can and see what happens who knows shams what is the word with zion we 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 heard of setbacks we heard that yo they're gonna they're gonna run them out there either way what are you hearing out of new orleans are we gonna see the big fella this season yeah, the Pelicans have been optimistic that he's going to return at some point before the end of the regular season. I'm told he did some on-court running and shooting this week, uh, but I haven't been told that he's progressed at all to significant contact work, and obviously that would have to be the last step or one of the last final stage steps before you get back out on the floor. I haven't heard that he's done that yet, so that gives you a little bit of pause as far as when exactly he'll be back. I think the Pelicans will reevaluate him this week and see exactly where he's at and how much more time he needs to get to that point but like Chandler said I mean you 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 need Zion Williamson if you're going to be competitive and this is a team that has also blown leads uh, over the last month or so uh you know big leads to teams so they need their guy they need the guy in, in Zion Williamson because not only was he dominating and playing his position but he was really playing point guard at different points for the Pelicans bringing the ball up the floor um and, and really initiating the offense for the Pelicans they they've missed that so far Evan, we just saw your boy Dame Lillard say, basically, yo, when the games don't matter, I'm out of here. But Dame is a vet. Dame has been doing this for years. He's over 30 years old. You got a guy like Zion. He's yet to show he can play a whole season. He's really yet to show he can really get back from injury like this. Would you play if you were Zion? Do you think he should get back on the court if he's healthy? No, I definitely, I definitely would play. And it's for the sake of, um, you know, I think Dame's situation is a little bit different with the roster. The roster that they have, if he does play, they are a very dangerous team. You've seen what they did last year with the energy from, you know, the play-in game, the emotions from the crowd and everything. I think it's energy and um, 
his presence could really, you know, help them go on a run. You have to go up against a CJ McCollum. You got to go up against a Brandon Ingram. Um, you got to go up against Zion Williamson, Trey Murphy, like tons of talent where it's going to be a problem to match up against. And, and those guys, they're great and prone at playing just open court basketball. So it doesn't have to, doesn't mean that they have to do anything to mesh right away. They can just come back and play and be, be a problem. Yeah, I love that we meet these guys when they're 14 because then they start getting these wild tats. Zion with the Mount Zion across his back. I mean, it fits. Big guy. But Shams, thank you for being here. It's our Friday. I know you never have Friday. You're always working. But thank you for being here. When we come back, we're talking March Madness with College Hoops insider John Rothstein. I can't wait to hear what he thinks of our awful brackets. <laughs> but we'll be back in a second. This March, protect yourself against upsets with Bracket Parlay Insurance on FanDuel Sportsbook. Right now, all customers can get bonus bets back each day if your parlay of three legs or more falls just one leg short. With the parlay, you can turn a small bet into a big score. And with cash out, you're calling the shots. You can settle your bet before the game is even over. So don't miss your chance to tip off the tourney with bonus bets back each day. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Guys, we're here with our guest today. It's FanDuel family member. He's the co-host of the College Hoops Today podcast and an insider for CBS Sports, John Rothstein. John, how you living? Where are you at? It's sunny. Where are you at? You're not rain, getting rained on in L.A. like everybody else? No, nah, man. We're in New York. It's beautiful. But as you guys know, you don't really see much of the outside until after the NCAA tournament is over. There was a line in the movie The Firm, which was a Tom Cruise movie from the early 90s, and, you know, Tom Cruise is visiting his brother in prison. And, you know, he says to Tom Cruise, you know, you got to get me out of here. And Tom Cruise will, goes, well, where do you want to go? And he goes, any place I can see a whole lot of sky. That's kind of how you feel when you're covering the NCAA tournament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm old enough to remember the firm. Uh, let's yeah. get to my bracket. Let's get it out the way. It looks terrible. I'm no college basketball <laughs> expert, which you can see right here. That's a lot of X's. But Chandler, on the other hand, He's doing amazing. If we look at his bracket, yeah. I don't know what he did. I don't know his secret. What, what, what do you what do you think of my bracket, man? What do you think of Chandler's? How bad have we done so far? Well, Chandler is pristine with his bracket right now. I got to give him a major, major tip of the cap because other than Purdue going down and what was the biggest upset in the history of the NCAA tournament, Chandler is really, really showing you know his range just like he did when he was at Florida. So when we look uh, at the when we look at the tournament, go, yeah, ahead, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, listen, I honestly well, I, the fact that Florida was so bad this year, I didn't have a biased pick having Florida going all the way to the final four. So it didn't ruin my bracket. So I think that actually helped me when I was picking teams. Uh and honestly, Purdue, I don't think anybody had them losing to to Fairleigh Dickens. I believe that's who it was. But uh yeah, listen, a, a little a lot of luck here, a little bit of watching, and uh and here we are. Elite eight is looking pretty good. Elite is eight is definitely looking good for you, but anything can change in college basketball very, very quickly. That is true. John, I'm the John, I'm the consummate, like I'm watching to see who the pros are guy. I do the same with college football. If I'm watching the tournament right now, I'm watching who's left in the field. Which one of these teams has the most NBA talent? Which one of these teams has the guys I'm going to see next year or in the next few years under the big lights? Well, I think you have to start, obviously, with Alabama because Alabama has the best prospect in the NCAA tournament in Brandon Miller. But there's also other prospects on Alabama that are really, really intriguing. Noah Clowney, Jaden Bradley, all guys that people are going to gravitate towards. I think the interesting thing about the NCAA tournament is – You've got guys who are really, really good college players, but as we've seen, college success may not directly correlate to the NBA. And, you know, I would say if you're looking at the three best players remaining in the 2023 NCAA tournament, Brandon Miller would be one, and then I'd go with UCLA's Jaime Jaquez and also Gonzaga's Drew Timmy is two and three. Mm. Yeah, John, <laughs> talking about Alabama and Brandon Miller, Obviously, his length, his size. What 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 separates him? What's what makes Brandon Miller the best prospect in college basketball? I mean, he's an effortless offensive talent. He can go over the top of defenses. He's got a really really good mid range game. He can handle the basketball. He's also a really effective rebounder. 
you know, I think, you know, the GMs and the scouts and guys like you will dissect his game a little bit more as we get closer to the NBA draft. But there is a lot of Paul George and Brandon Miller right now. Yeah, John, I was wondering what Cinderella team has the best shot of pulling off another upset, you think? You know, good question, Evan. I think, you know, you look at the dynamic of this NCAA tournament and you think about the fact that, you know, seeds in a lot of ways have been meaningless this year and rankings have been meaningless because there's so much parity in college basketball. I think if you're looking for a lower seeded team to have an advantage in the Sweet 16, it's Michigan State over Marquette, but that's not really an upset because Tom Izzo is still coaching Michigan State. I think, you know, Florida Atlantic led by Dusty May, is being completely overlooked. This is not just a clear path to the Elite Eight for Tennessee. Tennessee obviously lost its point guard, Zakai Ziegler, a couple of weeks ago to an ACL injury. It was good enough to rally and beat Duke last week. But if you're telling me, you know, a real, true, traditional NCAA tournament upset from a lower-seeded team, I would say FAU over Tennessee. I'm not going to count Michigan State as an upset for obvious reasons. All right, look, let's just ask the million-dollar question and please pick the same answer as I pick so I look like I'm smart. But what team do you have tearing down the nets and winning the tournament after what we've seen after the first weekend? I picked Alabama at the start of the season, so I started the Final Four, or started the NCAA tournament, so I'm not going to waver from that. I had Alabama, Duke, Texas, and Gonzaga. Alabama over Gonzaga winning the national championship, so I'm not going to waver from those predictions. Obviously, though, if I had to recalibrate things, in that East region, I would pick Michigan State to come out of that region and represent the Big Ten in the uh, Final Four. I like it. That was my pick. I look smart. Thanks to you. you You're making me look smart. John, thanks for being here. Enjoy the rest of the tournament. I cannot wait to see some more of these games. And look, when we come back, we lost another parlay. So we're going to laugh about it. And I think Evan is going to get us right. I think I looked at his pick. I love it. I think we're going to win this time. And be back in a second. I'm running back. Run it up. Run it back. Yeah, Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. FanDuel Casino's March Weekly Sunday Sweeps is here, and you can win a share of $300,000 each week from March 14th through April 2nd. Every Tuesday through Saturday, opt in on any bet of $200 or more, and it gets you an entry into Sunday's sweepstakes drawing. See FanDuel Casino for more details on how you can enter the March Weekly Sunday Sweeps. Guys, the less we say about yesterday's parlay, the better. But I'll give Michelle her credit. She was the one who won, so we'll tip the hat to Michelle. I don't even know what happened in the Wizards game. The Nets over the cat. I don't know what Chandler was thinking, but the Thunder, they look great. Today, we redeem ourselves. I like my picks today. I'm not so sure about yours, but we'll see. Um... Chandler, what happened, man? You picked the Nets? I mean, I didn't pick them to win. I just thought maybe they would lose <laughs> three, or three or less. Give me a briz. <laughs> hey, well, look, tonight I got DeMar DeRozan over 22 points. These guys just – I love when teams play, like, back-to-back -back against each other. It looks terrible every time. But DeMar was scoring at will the other night. He's going to score at will again this – tonight. I can't wait. It was going to be an exciting game. Chandler, who you got? I got the Heat at home by two against the Knicks. I think the Heat are a very dangerous team. I think they have a tough culture, and I think they're honestly a better team than the Knicks. So give me them winning by two at home. Evan, homer pick. And it, Tell us about it. Yeah, no, I got uh, I got Damian Lillard scoring, you know, at least 37 points over uh, the Jazz tonight. I think the matchup and everything fares well for him. And, you know, Dame's just a scoring savant. This is what he does. End of the year, I, yeah, I see at least 40s, at least. Especially if he's going to shut it down, he's going to go out with a bang. It's crazy hey, how high these over-unders have gotten with points. Like, 37 points, that, that's like a career high. And now this is this guy's <laughs> betting points. It's insane. Yeah, I he said the same thing. I went to bet. I went to Ben and Bede, and his is like 36, too. And I'm like, whoa, this, this is just what the game is now. But Evan, thank you for being here once again. Heard a rumor we might be seeing you in person soon, big fella. I can't wait for that. Shout out to the Lady Buckeyes as well. I'm rooting for them for you. That's our Friday on Run It Back. It's been fun, everybody. We'll be back next week. Can't wait. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back.